Good morning. All right. Well, last week was Easter. Amen. <clears throat> Super Bowl Sunday. And then some. Um, how was your week? Do you ever wonder what the disciples' first week was after Easter? It was probably really exciting. But then after Jesus ascended, and they said, go, and he said, go, do you ever wonder if they just kind of looked at each other and were like, all right, we're doing this. Right? Um, I want to, before we, uh, before we get into it, I want to tell you a story. So, sometimes we have mountaintop experiences, right? And there are different things in our lives that are like landmarks. Like, buying a home is a big deal. Having kids is an even bigger deal. Getting married is a big deal. It's like, there are a lot of mountaintop events and experiences that we go through in life. And my wife and I recently, we bought a new home, and it's wonderful, and it's great, and it's a mountaintop experience. And we have all this extra room, and we're expecting our fifth, um, and which is going to be a boy, by the way. Sorry, everybody. Uh, <laughs> Or you're welcome, everybody. Um, but, yeah. <laughs> we, bought, we bought this house, and we're getting situated. It was at the very end of February. And, you know, it is a big and amazing thing. And move-in day, we have friends and family helping us clean and, and move stuff in and unpack. And then everyone leaves. And sometimes we have Easter Sunday, and we forget about Easter Monday. And we have to go back to our normal lives. Plus. Um, and last night, so we've been in our house for like two months, something like that. Last night, I'm trying to finish my message, True Confessions. Um, and let's just say there was an issue... At the, at the plumbing in the bathroom that I had to take care of as the dad of the house. Um, and I go to turn off the water to take care of business, and water starts spewing and spraying everywhere. And in that moment, I was not thinking about, oh, this wonderful house that we just bought. It was 8.30, I'm trying to finish up my message, and water is spewing on the floor and on the wall in my upstairs bathroom. And so I have to run down, we have a two-story, so I have to run down one, two, just two flights of stairs, all the way to the basement, shut off the, shut off the water for the whole house. I got to drain the water for the whole house, and maybe that was unnecessary, but, and then I got to get in there, and so I took, I I, you know, I was a 740 man, and I took care of business, right? And I took off the, the thing and, and the stop valve or whatever, and, and I look on my phone, and I open up Google Maps, and Ace Hardware is closed. And so I'm like, oh, I'll just go to Walmart. So I drive to Walmart. Walmart doesn't have that. And so it's like 9 o'clock, and I'm like, Meg, I'm going to Menards. Um, and so I drive to Menards. And I'm standing in that aisle, and lo and behold, there are about a million different versions of a stop valve to install on the back of your toilet. And it's like, luckily I brought the thing with me, because <clears throat> after staring and probably inspecting every single one for like an hour, I finally humbled myself and asked for help. Thank <laughs> you. 
And in my, in my brokenness and humility, um, the guy pointed it out immediately. He's like, oh, this one. It's like, okay. <laughs> All right. And I drive back, <clears throat> and I'm like laying across my toilet, which probably wasn't clean, um, <laughs> fixing the plumbing, and just to, so, because it's like if you don't fix that, it's an open pipe. You can't have showers, you can't wash your hands, you can't go to the bathroom, whatever. So I had to do it. And sometimes we just, life goes on. And, East, and Easter Sunday happens, and it, we're like, yes, Jesus is alive, I'm a new creation, death is defeated, the tomb is empty, I, like, let's go, let's go, let's preach the gospel, let's make disciples of all nations. And then you wake up the next morning, and you got to go to work, right? Or your kid throws up. Or you have to go back to your family, and you're, you're, you've got to take the kids to school. You have to homeschool, whatever you do. It's like, you got to go to the grocery store. It's like, and we're still going to go, right? We're still going to preach the gospel. We're still going to teach all nations to follow after Christ and obey all the things that he commanded us. But the book, you know, you read the Bible, you read the gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the gospels happened over, it, it, it's like each account, Jesus' ministry was three years long. And sometimes we're getting, not sometimes, we are getting the highlight reel. You know, three years didn't pass in 22 chapters. Or 28 chapters, like Matthew. You know, there weren't 28 days to Jesus' ministry. There were three years. That's three, six, nine, over a thousand days. So what do you do on Easter Monday? And after Jesus is risen, we have the good news. Nothing about that has changed. But what do you do in the day-to-day? -day? Right? I remember when we, another, another experience is when we had our first child. Zion, my only and oldest daughter, um, she turned 10 on Friday. 10. I have a double-digit kid. That's... Um, but she turned 10. And when we were at the hospital, we, it was a Sunday morning. Chris, my brother-in-law, led worship for me because Meg went into labor. And, and, and Zion's born. And it was amazing. It was one of the most amazing experiences of my life. I couldn't believe it. This little cute thing, which was, was cute. Um, like, wow, God, you're so good. And we stayed the night, the Sunday night, and I think for some reason we had to stay the night Monday night. So Tuesday, they check us out. We, we're leaving the hospital. And they're like, all right, you can go. And my wife and I kind of look at each other. We're like, you're just going to let us go? <laughs> I mean, this is, a, this is a human. We've never raised a human before. And so driving home, I'm like, like, it's just a Tuesday to everyone else in the world. But me, I have my wife, and this tiny little us in the back. And it's like the sun was brighter, probably because we were in a hospital room for the last three days. But it's like the sun was brighter, everything was more vivid, and I'm just freaking out, trying to not crash and die on the way back to our apartment because it was like, this is so precious. And then we got home. And then we had a baby to take care of. And sometimes we had a baby to take care of at 2 a.m. So you get what I'm saying? Mountaintop experiences are good. And God works those in. The Bible talks about times, seasons of refreshing. But it's like, there comes a time where things kind of even out, and we have normal life. And it doesn't make it any less amazing. It doesn't make God's truth any less significant. 
But it re- what we need to realize is we need to learn how to follow Jesus in the everyday. Because if you're chasing an event, mountaintop experience Christianity, you will go in circles looking for experiences. And you will lose the maturity that God does in your heart and the real life that God wants you to engage in in the normal day-to-day things. So, open your Bibles to John chapter 14. How do we follow Jesus after the mountaintop experiences? When it's not always obvious what to do or where to go. See, the disciples were in a situation just like this before the crucifixion. And they were unsure about what was going to happen next. And I think we can learn from it today. So in, Ma- in John, John, not Matthew, John chapter 14, we're going to read six verses. John chapter 14, verse 1 through 6. It says, Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God and believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would not have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may also be. And you know the way where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How do we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Let's pray. Father, Lord, we just thank you for your word. Holy Spirit, we just thank you for your presence here among us today. God, we thank you, Jesus, that you're seated on your throne. Lord, that you're the king of all kings. Lord, that you're the Lord of all lords. That you defeated every enemy and you won every victory at the cross. Lord, and in the tomb where you laid and now is empty, Lord, with your resurrection, Father, we can die with you and be new creations through faith in you. Lord, we can rise again just as you were raised, God, and we can come into new life because of what you did through the cross, your death, your burial, your resurrection. Father, we thank you for Easter. We thank you for the wondrous work that you accomplished, the triumph over death, the triumph over sin in the grave. Lord, that you paid for with your blood. God, and I pray that you would help us to follow after you each and every day. Lord, I pray that you would anoint me to preach your word. God, that you would help me to rightly divide your word. God, that, you, that we would be good stewards of your truth and that we would apply it to our lives, that we would bear fruit that would last in our everyday life. In Jesus' name, everyone said, Amen. Amen. So let me give you a little bit of background to this passage. In chapter 13 of John, three things happen that make this passage a little bit more significant. The first thing in verse 21 is the disciples just found out that one of them was going to betray Jesus. They're at the Last Supper. They just found out one of them was going to betray Jesus. They also just found out that Jesus is leaving them soon. They don't know where he's going, and he said that they can't come with him. Imagine you're eating dinner with your rabbi after three years, and he's all of a sudden, someone is going to betray me. I'm actually going to leave, and you can't come with me. And then, <clears throat> when Peter says, Lord, where are you going? Lord, why can't I not follow you right now? I will lay down my life for you. Peter's told that, Peter, before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times. So this is like bad news. This is a tough situation. And then we get to our, our, our passage here. And what does Jesus say? Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God and believe also in me. 
Verse 2, in my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would not have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. See, when we ask ourselves, where do we go from here in our normal life, in our day-to-day, the first thing that we need to realize is our destination is not just a place, it's to a person. You want to do that first point? Our destination is not just a place. It is to a person. If you're looking for the place that you're going, you're missing the point. Salvation is not between the bad place and the good place. Unfortunately, our culture has kind of reduced it to, well, the bad place that no one wants to go to, but we don't really talk about, and the good place where most everybody goes to because it's pleasant. And that's just not at all the truth. Jesus cares about the state of our hearts. Listen, what he says, he says, do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. See, Jesus cares about the turmoil that they're in, this dire situation that they're in, and he is giving them a glimpse into what's to come as they continue to walk out their faith in him. He cares about the state of our hearts, and he cares about, he cares about the state of the disciples' hearts, and he cares about the state of our hearts. Amen? And when we're stuck in normal life, and things might even look bad, Jesus is saying, don't lose heart. Believe in God, and believe also in me. Because where we're going is not a place only. It is a place, but it's not just a place. Listen to how he speaks. He speaks of his father's house. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have not told you. I was reading this passage the other day, and just to get the full context, I was reading through chapter 13, and, and you know, I was, initially I was really focused on what we're going to talk about today, but, but I was going through chapter 13, and I'm like, man, this is bad. And then the very first before he starts saying this, it's like, Peter, you're going to deny me three times. It's like, that's not good news. And then all of a sudden he starts talking about houses. It's like, what? what? How does this help? Right? Peter, you're going to deny me. But there's a lot of rooms in my father's house. It's like, how does that help me? What he's saying is he cares about the state that they're in. Obviously, it's not the end of the story for Peter. But he's talking about his father's house as a place to dwell. It's a place of permanence. It's a steady place. We have a home with the Father that Jesus has made a way to. Amen? Through all of our trials, our circumstances, all the situations, whether good, bad, or ugly, that we may face, we have this anchor of hope that Jesus died for us, that we would have a way to the Father. Amen? Don't let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God and believe also in me. This is not the individualistic, gated community, many mansions, King James Version. No offense to the King James Version. Absolutely not. But it's just a mistranslation of that word. It's not mansions. You're not going to have a mansion with like your, a sprinkler in your heaven lawn. You know? And unfortunately, it really plays into the, the American dream. It's like we have this idea that I'm going to have my own stuff, my own thing, and my own stuff going on, and it's just going to be great, and I'm going to have a, I got a big house here, and I'm going to have a big house in heaven, and I'm going to have like a mansion by the heaven lake, and maybe I'll have a heaven boat. Because I'm just going to go to the good place and have a good time. But is that the truth? 
No, what is he talking about? In my Father's house. Where are we going? Jesus' Father's house. We're not going to, in, in the great real estate of heaven, you will have your dream house. That's not the point. See, one thing that this could be referring to is in the Jewish culture, when a husband would... would uh, would, when a husband and a wife, would they would be engaged, they'd be betrothed to each other. During their engagement period, the husband would go off to his father's house and he would build a room onto his father's house. And so when, during the engagement period, that's what he would be doing. He would be preparing a place on his father's house. And then he would come and he would... They, him and his wife would get married, or him and his fiance would get married. They're basically married. The engagement period was being married. They would get married, consummate the marriage, and then they would move into this prepared place on the father's house. And that's not the only thing this could be referring to. It could be talking about the temple we see in Ezekiel, but the thing is, the point is not that you're going to have this nice place to yourself. The point is re relational. We're not going to a place. We're going to a person. The goal is not just to go to heaven. Heaven is paradise because it's where the presence of God is. Do you realize that? I mean, the saying goes, home is where the heart is. So wherever your heart is, that's where your home is. So it's like that. It's where God is, is paradise. Psalm 1611, is it up there? Yes. David writes, you will make known to me the path of life in your presence. Whose presence? God's presence. In your presence is fullness of joy. In your right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. We're going to be with our Father. We're going, we're ushered in by the blood of the Lamb shed for us. We're going to be, spend eternity with God in three persons, blessed Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We're going to join with saints and angels singing holy around God's throne. And heaven is cool. I mean, you read Revelation it's cool. It's wild. But that's not the point. It's not the point. Heaven is where God is. Hell is not just the just reward for being our own judges for our own lives and our own account of sin. But it's separation from God. So it's not just punishment for sin, which it was reserved for the devil and his angels. But since we all fall short, the wages of our sin is death and separation from God. To be in the presence of God is to know him and to know him is our destination. John 17, 3, this is eternal life. This is eternal life. That we may know you, the true God, Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. This is eternal life. That they may know you, the Father. Is that up there? John 17, 3. That we may know you, the only true God. And Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Look at the language Jesus, is, Jesus uses. My Father's house. I go to prepare a place for you. I will come back and get you. Where I am, that's where you will be. Does that sound like we're going to the place or we're going to the person? So the second thing 
is Jesus is the way. John 14, 4 through 6, it says, And you know the way where I'm going. Verse 5, Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How do we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You know, whether we're on the mountaintop or the valley low, whether we're having a great, wonderful time, or we're just going through the day-to-day mundane things of life, Jesus is the way. Amen? He's the only way. Acts 2, or Acts 4, 12, if you have that, is there is salvation in no one else. Say no one else. There is salvation in no one else. God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved than the name of Jesus. There is only one way, and his name is Jesus. There's not many ways to paradise, to heaven. It's like there's, there's not many ways. You know, all roads don't lead to Rome. There's one way, and his name is Jesus. And that is countercultural now. I mean, it was then. Did you know in Rome, there were so many false gods that the believers who were called, often referred to as the way, they were called atheists in Rome because they didn't acknowledge Caesar as a demigod and they didn't acknowledge any of the gods of Rome. Christians were the original atheists, I guess. Because we said, no, there is one God and one name under heaven by which men can be saved, and his name is Jesus. He is the only way of salvation, the only way to the Father, like a bridge over an unending divide. The cross and the resurrection made a way for us to be forgiven and have relationship with God where there was no other way otherwise. Jesus not only provided the way to the Father, but He is the way we are to follow. He's the path, but He is also the pursuit. He is the way. Following Jesus is the destination. It's not just a means to an end. If we were going to a place and Jesus was just a ticket, it'd be a means to an end. But we're not just doing that. Amen? Sometimes we're in seasons of life where we don't know what to do. You don't know where to go. You don't know what decision to make. But Jesus is the way. Amen? There could be some decisions that need to be made, but sometimes we're just living our normal lives and wondering what's next. And this is when we need to realize that following Jesus is always the right way to go. And I don't mean it's a... WWJD, what would Jesus do? Checklist. Do you remember those bracelets? This is not a chart. You don't, this, this is not a reference book. Amen? Like Paul was talking about. This is not just a book to be referenced. It's God's living word. It's his voice. It's the logos. It's a relationship with the shepherd of our souls who faithfully leads us from season to season in our lives. Amen? Jesus is the way. And I've heard a lot of people grapple with just, you know, what's the point? Because sometimes life can get pretty, you can get in ruts. Anybody ever get in a rut? And you think, is this Is this all that life has to offer? I wake up, I go to work, I come home, I go to bed. I eat somewhere in between all of that. Well, if you want to see things like that, that's, you know, pretty depressing. But I get that people get there. But there's so much more to life than just a routine. There's following Jesus each and every day. 
And my question is, have you lost track of who you're following? Not just the direction you're supposed to be going. Right? Because our, our culture likes to make, our cultural Christianity, I should say, likes to make good people. But God doesn't want good people. He wants sons and daughters. I mean, even when someone told Jesus, good teacher, Jesus said, why do you call me good? Only God is good. We have traded righteousness and God's family for kindness and being a good person. And sometimes speaking the truth in love is not the kindest thing, right? Psalm 25, verse 4 through 5 says, Make me know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me. For you are the God of my salvation. For I wait all the day. Third third thing is, Jesus is the truth. In our day-to-day, we need to realize that Jesus is the truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus does more than tell the truth, although he tells the truth. Amen? He is full of truth, John 1.14, and he literally is truth, according to this passage. Amen? Truth is a big deal to God. I mean, if you just... I mean, you could... Look, Just do the most basic, open a Bible app and search truth. Just the word truth. And you're going to have hundreds, hundreds, Old Testament, New Testament. Truth is a big deal to God. When Jesus speaks to the woman at the well, he tells her the way that we are to worship God is in spirit and in truth. How are we supposed to worship God if we don't know who He is? One, we need to know the truth. Jesus said, your word is truth. If we don't know the word of God, do you know the truth? We need to know the word of God. Truth is a big deal to God. Psalm 51, 6. It said, behold, you desire truth. Actually, Uh, It's before the Colossians. Yeah, there we go. Behold, you desire truth in the innermost being. God desires us to be filled with truth. And in the hidden part, you will make me know wisdom. Psalm 86, 15. But you, O Lord, are a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness and truth. Go to the next one. Psalm 31, 5. It says, into your hands I commit my spirit. You have ransomed me, O Lord, God of truth. Truth is very important because God is a God of truth. We can depend on him and trust in him completely. Amen? What makes someone trustworthy? They tell the truth. You test their actions. You see what they do. They're, they don't just speak with their mouth. They act and they follow through. Numbers, I don't know if it's up there, but Numbers 23.19 says, 23.19 says, God is not a man that he should lie. God's not going to lie to us. Amen? He is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. Has he said it? And will he not do it? Or has he spoken, and will he not make good? You can count on the word of the Lord. Amen? The Bible says that the word of the Lord does not return void. It bears fruit. It accomplishes what it sets out to do. Every time. Jesus is faithful to his word, and he'll do what he said he'll do. Amen? He is absolutely dependable. He is absolutely trustworthy. And you can bet your life and your eternity on it. But we have to live in that truth. 
See, truth isn't just the better option to a lie. Right? It's not just not lying. Truth is God's very design for all creation. Colossians chapter 1, verse 16 and 17 says, For by him, Jesus, all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth. Visible, you have first, uh, Colossians chapter 1. There we go. For by him, all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things, say all things, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things and in him, say in him, all things hold together. So Jesus made all things, say all things. What did Jesus create? So was any, John chapter 1, was anything made that wasn't made through him? No. And they were made for who? Him. So all things were made through him and for him. And what does it say? In who? In him, all things hold together. Jesus is the author of creation, and he is the truth. And when we go against God's design, we are coming against the very truth of God. Do you see this? What is this? An outlet. What? It's not a shut off. This is an outlet. In the house that we bought, I was... Uh, we started by just taking off wallpaper to paint. And that turned into uh, taking off the wainscoting. And that turned into skim coating the whole wall because there was plaster and lath. And that turned into ripping out the kitchenette that was attached. And that turned into ripping the other thing out. And that turned into building a wall. And that turned into making a laundry room. And that turned into a bunch of other things. So for about a $50 can of paint... I'm about several hundred dollars deep and three months later or something like that. Um, so don't peel wallpaper, kids. Um, <laughs> it's a slippery slope. Um, but here's the deal. We framed a wall. I had some wonderful help to put in some elect electrical, and now I have some outlets on both sides of this wall that we framed up. We're going to have a laundry room and a family room for the kids and toys and stuff. But this is an outlet. And this is what we do when we live outside God's design. We say, this outlet, you know, what is this used for? Powering things. You plug it in. You, you know, we could grab one of these guitar pedals and just plug it right in. But is anything going to happen? No. No. Okay, what if I framed a wall right here and got a, a box for this, the way it's meant to be, and I, and I put it properly on the stud and then plugged it in? Okay, what if I put sheetrock on that wall and, and painted it and it looked really nice and now it just looks like a normal wall and, and then plugged it in? Okay, what if I built an entire house around that wall and even put in furniture? And then plugged it in. What if I built an entire town around this beautiful house? And then plugged it in. Why? There's no connection to the power. It's outside of its design. It was not meant to sit in a wall powerless. And when we exchange the truth of God for a lie, it doesn't matter how much we put makeup on that thing, it's not going to work. Right? Truth is important. What was created through Him? 
all things. Was there anything created that hasn't been created? I mean, John chapter 1 even repeats it. Just to make sure. Everything was created through Christ and for Christ. And everything is currently being held together by His will and good pleasure. And so when we operate outside of His truth, we might not be lying, but we are living in a fantasy. We are living in deception. We are living a lie. Because I cannot say, I will walk on this air as I fall off. I'm not going to fall off. Because the truth is, I will walk on air and come back onto these steps. Right? I mean, but, but, but Pastor Tony, that's just, that's just gravity. I invented these boots with jet boosters on the bottom, and if you walk off that, you will now float. It's like, who cares? That's just putting makeup on the fact that you claim that you're walking off the, the wall, right? We have to live in God's truth. And so when we, when we go throughout our day-to-day life and we say, oh, God doesn't really care about me, that's not true. Well, bad things are happening, so God must hate me. That's not true. Well, this person hurt me, so I'm not going to forgive them. That is a bad idea. Because that's not how God designed things to work. If while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, while we were enemies of God, He forgave us, we need to forgive others. And the truth is, that is what is going to set us free. Forgiveness in that situation. And our, so there's, I mean, the, the postmodernists in our culture right now or you can look at a box of Kleenexes and say that's a lunchbox. I mean, you could use it as a lunchbox, but it's a box of Kleenexes. We are exchanging so much truth in our culture for a lie. We are calling what is wicked righteous, and what is righteous wicked. And it's not, it, it's, it's not. The technicalities, sometimes you can, you can, with technology, with, with the right angle, with whatever you want to spin it with, you can make it look really nice, but it's still against God's design. And this applies to a range of things, guys. It's like... All the things that, I mean, just a very basic thing. It's like all the things that we find out, like, are guaranteed going to give you cancer. Well, if you keep doing it and you get cancer, you know, that's one example. It's like, you can say it's not going to, but the truth is, it's, it, could, it could give you cancer, right? I remember watching, and, and I was sharing this with someone the other day, I would remember watching an interview from back when the AIDS epidemic was going on. I was not alive then, but I was watching an interview, and the reporter, apparently, everyone thought they were going to die of AIDS. It was hysteria. And then, a reporter on this live broadcast is finding out from this specialist, wait a second, you're telling me if I stay faithfully married to one person and basically don't use dirty needles, I am not going to get AIDS. And they're like, yep. And it was like blowing that person's mind. It's like God's design for monogamous marriage between a man and a woman actually has real life benefits. I mean, you can go through every single thing. You can go through, I mean, 
It's like there, there's forgiveness, guys, and there's redemption, and there is restoration where we fall short. But you can go through almost every metric. You can look at uh, divorce. You look at uh, what happens with kids. You look at all these things, and, and the, there are visible metrics that you can just watch about how it impacts people's lives. And the closer you get to God's design, the better things get. Why is that? Because we're called to live in truth. We're called to follow the way, the truth, because where we follow the way into the truth, there's life. Amen? The third point is Jesus is the life. John 1, 4, in him was life, and the life was the light of man. John 8, 12 says, Then Jesus spoke to them and said, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Jesus is the life, and apart from him, there is none. John chapter 10 says, The enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Anything that the enemy can get his hands on, he's going to try to bring it right into the ground. But Jesus said, I came that they would have life. Jesus is the life. Ephesians 2 says that while we were dead in our sins, God made us alive in Christ and saved us by his grace. There is life in Christ. And we're, when we're going about our day to day and you feel like you're in a rut, you feel like there's no life to what you're doing, look not to the direction that you're going, but to the who that you're following. Double check that you're in the truth. Or have you been deceived? The thing about being deceived is you're deceived. Right? If you, you don't know what you don't know. And oftentimes, we're walking in circles deceived, and we're like, why is this happening? And then we read, and we're like, that is why that's happening. Right? Because we need to know the truth. We need to follow the way, the only way. And we need to walk in the truth. And when we walk in the truth in, towards the way, Jesus we start to encounter the life. Amen? And even the mundane becomes alive. Right? When you're following Jesus, He takes you on an adventure. I mean, you read the book of Acts. They were doing a lot of normal stuff. And some pretty amazing things happened. In the day to day, as they were following Christ. Apart from Christ, our spirits are dead. But when we put our trust in Him, He makes us alive. Amen? He removes our hearts of stone and gives us a new heart of flesh, a responsive heart, a heart that can call out to Him, Abba, Father, with new and right desires. In John chapter eleven twenty five, 25, it says, He Himself is our resurrection and life. And when we experience the life of Christ, and when we're walking in His Spirit, we start to see fruit. And that's the stuff that we can share with others. Amen? Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And when we come down off of the mountaintop experiences and have to walk through normal life, if we set our compass to Christ, He will never disappoint. Amen? Let's stand and pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank You Lord, we thank you that where there was no way, you made a way for us. 
God, we thank you that you are rich in mercy, that you're patient, that you're kind, that you are the one true way, that you are the one true truth, and that you are the life. God, I pray that you would teach us to follow after you each and every day. That we would trust you. God, and I pray that you would help us to listen to you as we go about our day. Lord, that you would quicken your word to our hearts. God, that we would be going into all the world and sharing the good news of what you've done for us on the cross and through your resurrection. And God, as we go about what seems to be just our average daily life, Lord, you would introduce us again to the abundant life that's found in your presence. Lord, we love you, and we ask that you would continue to faithfully lead us as the shepherd of our souls. We just give you all the glory and honor. In Jesus' name, everyone said amen. God bless you guys. Have a wonderful week.